Hello again from Cambridge, Massachusetts for another in our series of program notes on our Token Creek Festival virtual program. Today, it is called neoclassicists. And I'd like to say just a little bit about the term because we all use these terms with the full awareness that they are shaggy around the edges and easily contested. But in today's case, I will admit to a certain comfort in the case of the three pieces I'm going to be discussing. Three composers, most of whose work was done in the 20th century, but all of them originating in the 19th century. And all of them at least going through considerable phases of their career uh, with a really quite explicit objective to channel or incorporate or re-embody works of the past in some sort of coherent present style. So let's think for a moment about Ildebrando Pizzetti, an Italian composer who was born in 1860 and who amazingly enough was still alive in the American 50s, dying in 1961. As a young student, I remember being uh, informed about him and aware of him, in fact, as uh, described as the chamber music composer. And I was surprised to learn that instead, like all the Italian composers of his era, the main output of Pizzetti is in the field of opera. However, when you hear his very beautiful cello sonata in F, you will probably wonder how that sensibility would transfer to the operatic stage. And apparently, I say without any real feet on the ground knowledge, it didn't transfer very well. He is a reflective composer, a composer of a wonderful shadings of mood, of uh, nostalgia, even, even uh, I would say melancholy about the past. Um, his style, right away in the first few measures of his piece, you'll hear those Italian parallel thirds the beautiful kind of mellifluous quality of the of the clothing of the melody, the thing that we associate with Palestrina and with Verdi and with Puccini. But as the piece progresses, the material is taken, is absorbed in a rather different way than we're used to hearing Italian music uh, proceed. Closer perhaps in some ways to the develop, early development of Luigi Dalla Piccola, uh, who was a younger contemporary of Pizzetti. Um, Pizzetti's music moves gradually and in a leisurely fashion, even in the fast music. The fast music in the second movement is very impressively uh, animated, but it, it moves in large paragraphs. And uh, it is not dramatic or cinematic. It is really about, is about emotions and about a kind of privacy. This piece is very large in scope. Uh, it's, it's a, it, it takes up a lot of space and it is a real contribution to the literature for cello and piano. Um, existing in a wider, broader plane than most pieces in that literature and giving tremendous amount of chance for both instrumentalists to explore particularly the realm of sound, of sonority, of the voice of the melody. Um, so I'm very happy that we're acquainting you. I trust we probably are acquainting you with the cello sonata of Il di Brando Pizzetti as the first on uh, this program of neoclassicists. A very different kind of neoclassicism is in the work of the Czech composer 
uh, Boislav Martinu. There's something much more pragmatic, ready in a kind of daily sense, uh, absolutely tuned to the individual moment about Martinu. The, the word craftsmanship is something we always speak of very reluctantly about the arts because everyone should have it. But in the case of Martinu, it's not irrelevant in the sense that he is so devoted to the aspects of the profession that, that require a kind of old fashioned 17th or 18th century readiness to do whatever task is at hand, which he does with amazing skill. Uh, in my written program notes for this piece, I happen to recall the many, many times when as a coach of chamber music, I needed an unusual piece for some combination of instruments that really you wonder whether anyone did it. And Martin New did do it. Um, he seems to have styled his catalog such that it interested him to be able to do a piece for just about any combination of instruments that struck his fancy. And the great thing about it is the pieces are satisfying. And you may order them from the catalog, just saying, yes, we're getting a piece by Martineau. And what he comes through with is something musical, coherent, communicative, and clearly uh, very decisive stylistically. The three madrigals are for the combination of viola and cello. I'm sorry, between violin and viola. And violin and viola is a wonderful idiom for which there isn't much music. And one would think, since the fountainhead of literature for that combination is by Mozart, that many other composers would have followed suit, but very few have. And the Martineaus are beautifully imagined for the players. I don't know whether he was a player, but I really suspect he was one of those people who played a lot of instruments. Uh, and the pieces in concert hold their own, that is to say, we never feel that Martineau is not at, of a world-class level in terms of understanding how music is put together, what is emotionally connective about music and, and how we perceive form. The final piece is probably the most fun to talk about in a way because its premiere was given in Madison, Wisconsin, which is the origin point for the Token Creek Festival. Um, and of course it got there because of Stravinsky's connection to Boulanger and to certain apostles of Boulanger who took up residence in Madison. And Stravinsky's presence in Madison was an important event. Um, he, another piece, his solo viola piece also has origins in the city of Madison. This piece, this two piano sonata, it is the last piano piece, that is a piece in which we hear Stravinsky writing for the piano that we get from this composer, preceded by quite a few others. Um, it is at the height of his interest in his version of exploring the uh, gestures and habits of the past but I say gestures and habits, but not really often the deeper structure of the past. Um, Stravinsky neoclassicism is not of the scholarly kind and not really in the end of the imitative kind. It's more that he gets into a dialogue with the past and responds to it in a number of the tones of voice sometimes quite seriously, speaking of the symphony in three movements or the concerto for two pianos, sometimes in a somewhat more uh, jaunty and uh, even ironic tone, which I think is more prevalent in this little piece for two pianos. It has a very impressive variation movement and a brisk finale, which seems to be tossed off, but the more you hear it, the more you feel a kind of wit and play and mastery of an idiom. 
And in fact, the mastery of this idiom was becoming for Stravinsky a little too much around the time of this piece. This is among the latter, later ones in this string of really remarkable pieces in which he is committed, I would say, to uh, this particular attitude to the past. I don't think composers of, that, of his order ever really hit a dead end, but they do get restless. And this restlessness was soon to become much more uh, a daily worry for Stravinsky, uh, resulting in this remarkable uh, confrontation with a whole new set of premises for composition. I can't think of any other composer who so radically uh, redid his vocabulary at such a late state in life. And again, he had the pleasure of causing consternation, which he did when he began in the style that you hear here in, these, in this duo, tremendous consternation. And yet, everyone thought they had figured him out and everyone was shocked again. I've always been interested to hear the anecdotes from Robert Levin of his lessons with Boulanger when he brought up the pieces of Stravinsky, which were being produced when he was a student there, where he had moved off into areas that Boulanger found initially incomprehensible. Must have been a particular quiet pleasure for Stravinsky to stir things up yet again. <laughs> 